from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Hi, everyone. I'm Lenny Bernstein. I'm a health and medicine reporter for The Washington Post. And I have the honor of introducing our next author, David Sobel, um, author of The Glass Universe. Before we get there, a couple of things I'm supposed to tell you all. Um, you obviously, you're spending the day here in the cool and dry convention center instead of out on the mall. And we're very happy about that. Um, the Library of Congress puts this all together. They make it seem easy every year, get people in and out of here. Uh, and you get to see a lot of your favorite authors. Um, it's a very large financial undertaking, and it's only made possible by the generous support of our sponsors. This, uh, this presentation is sponsored by the uh, James Madison Council. Um, we can't take for granted that, everyone, that this event will continue to exist, so we'd like to ask you to consider making a contribution now using your cell phone. You can do it right now before you uh, leave this uh, presentation. Um, you can send a text to make a one-time gift, and the details are on the screen and on the back of your uh, program. Um, a couple of things that sort of uh, house, uh, some details about uh, what will happen next. Um, Ms. Sobel will have a signing time from 3 p.m. to 4 p.m. of her new book, and she's uh, in uh, line five. So if you uh, want to go get your book signed, Please, uh, please do that after this. Um, David Sobel uh, has been writing about science as a freelancer, a New York Times reporter, and an author since 1970. She's best known for her 1995 bestseller, Longitude, the true story of a lone genius who solved the greatest scientific problem of his time. Um, her book, Galileo's Daughter, was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in biography in 2000. Much cooler. She ha has uh, seen eight, uh, nine total eclipses now, <laughs> counting this one. She's an eclipse chaper, chaser. Um, and even cooler than that, the asteroid, the asteroid 30935 Davis Obel is named after her. <laughs> uh, during the Q&A that comes at the end of the uh, at the end of the presentation, you might want to ask how you get an asteroid named after yourself. Um, her latest book is called The Glass Universe, How the Ladies of the Harvard Observatory uh, Took the Measure of the Stars. And it reveals the extraordinary discoveries made by a group of women who analyzed and interpreted the observations made by male astronomers via telescope. So please welcome Davis Obel. Thank you. Really is a thrill to be here. I was a little mystified by the title of these sessions, though, uh, Contemporary Life. <laughs> and I, I'm wondering if it's a euphemism for science. Um, maybe, maybe. Um, I also want to reiterate the title of the book, which you see on the slide. There it is. Um, it's the glass universe. It was an intentional play on the term glass ceiling, uh, but I find that it often gets called the glass ceiling, and it's really not about that. It is really about a collection of photographs of the sky that were taken on glass plates. This is 19th century technology when photography was brought into astronomy and the, the medium uh, for taking pictures was an emulsion-coated glass plate. And uh, these half a million plates are still kept at Harvard. They're still used. In fact, they were in the news this week. Uh, I don't know how many of you saw an article about a discovery that was made in the late 15th century by some Korean astrologers who saw a guest star. And recently, uh, some historian astronomers really wanted to figure out whether that had been a, uh, a nova, a supernova, and they thought they would look at the 
Harvard glass plates and try to figure out um, if they could see that object again. And they did it. They, they found it on several of the plates. So, so that's my bow to contemporary life. Um, but now, now to return to the late 19th century. I um, first heard about these women more than 20 years ago. And I was fascinated to think that there was a whole room full of women doing astronomy at Harvard, which is certainly not a place people associate with um, wide open opportunities for women, especially in the 19th century. So I thought, I thought that was definitely a story. And I was um, even more excited when I saw how many pictures there were of the women. So I will um, try to show you as many of those as I can in the time we have. Uh, and part of the reason there were so many women was the broad-minded attitude of the very young director, Edward Pickering, who took over in 1877 when he was just 30 years old. And um, it, he, had, he had been teaching at MIT, and he was really a physicist. And so people were worried what sort of job he would do as head of the observatory, because he wasn't that interested in doing what established observatories did, which was really study uh, the mapping of the sky, the orbits of the planets and asteroids, comets, uh, and, and, and be largely in the service of navigation. But he was interested in the physics of the stars. And he started doing things that, that other observatories were not doing, uh, including hiring women. And there was a strong prejudice against higher education for women at this time. Although Pickering had been very open about letting interested women students come to his course at MIT. Uh, and this book, Sex in Education, A Fair Chance for the Girls, sounds like something that, that was good for women, but actually the argument was that going to college was dangerous for women in the college age years because devoting all that mental energy to schoolwork would cause their reproductive organs to atrophy. <laughs> and uh, Pickering uh, was also able to laugh at that, thank goodness, and um, uh, felt that, that uh, women had already demonstrated their ability to do astronomy. When he arrived at Harvard, the uh, daughter of one of the former directors was working there, the sister of another one. So there were about six women already employed at the observatory as computers. And he saw no reason not to keep that going. This is what the observatory looked like. It was a very attractive wooden building on a hill about a mile from Harvard Yard. Uh, there were two telescopes, and then the building that has the three smokestacks was the director's residence. So he was right there. He could just roll in and out of bed and be at work. This was the uh, big telescope under the big dome. It, it is still there. It's no longer used. Can't do much astronomy from Cambridge. Um, uh, sometimes uh, when, it, when it was in good repair, and it will be again, it's used for public nights, have people come and get a look at the planets and get turned on to astronomy. Uh, and this telescope was a gift to the observatory from the people of Boston. So here's one of these glass plates that I'm talking about. Some of them were photographs of unusual phenomena, such as a comet. Um, most of them are negatives, so the stars look black against a white background, stars or other objects. And um, the most interesting use of the plates, I think, um, was started by this couple. This is, was actually an astronomy love story. Um, because the, the man, Dr. Henry Draper, was an amateur astronomer. We have any amateur astronomers here? 
just a few. We need to get proselytizing here in Washington. Um, and the, the amateurs were the ones who could be at the forefront, especially if they were married to someone as wealthy as Anna Palmer Draper, uh, who was an, uh, an heiress. And she and her husband worked together. They took images together. And he was the first person to succeed in taking a photograph of the spectrum of a star. So the star's light run through a prism and spread out into its component wavelengths. And uh, this was so important. They were going to drop everything. He was going to stop teaching. He was a medical doctor, uh, but he taught. And uh, devote the rest of their lives to this project to photograph the spectra of the stars and figure out why the stars were different colors, maybe how they worked, what they were made of, what were the chemical components of the stars. This, as recently as the 1840s, 1850s, people had assumed they would never find out what the stars were made of because they were too far away. So there was just no hope of that. And now all of a sudden, with spectroscopy, it was possible. And Henry Draper said that the spectroscope had made the chemist's arms millions of miles long. So they were all set to do this when he suddenly contracted pneumonia and died at age 45. And she was determined to see his dream realized. And she was a, a friend of Pickering's. They had all, everybody doing astronomy was more or less friendly then. It's still a relatively small community, as you saw. Um, and she offered Pickering her personal fortune if he would do the work in her husband's name. And that's what gave him the means to hire so many women. So here is a textbook example of a spectrum. Of course, we are long before color photography in the 1880s. This was what some of the best of the images looked like for the very brightest stars. And most of the time, the pictures looked like this. Because Pickering figured out that uh, if he put the prism at the far end of the telescope instead of the eyepiece, he could capture hundreds on every plate. And then it would just be a question of examining the plate with a magnifying glass or a microscope. And you could have all those spectra together. So every little smudge in this illustration is the spectrum of a star. And the black circle is a penny, just for size. So here are the ladies. There's Pickering standing in the back. And uh, this is obviously a staged photograph. Um, but this is pretty much what they did. In the foreground is a woman with a magnifying glass. And she's looking at an angled stand. And that's how they held the plates, which were, most of them were about 8 by 10 inches. And there was a mirror under the stand. And if the shades were up in the room, then the sunlight would come in, bounce off the mirror, and up through the plate so the plate would be illuminated. And then she would be looking at the spectrum and deciding what classification it was and calling that out to a partner who would be writing the notes. You didn't want to be looking at the plate and then turning to write in a notebook. So they had a very well-organized system. And their, their classification system started out just being letters of the alphabet. They would look at these patterns and arbitrarily decide, OK, this pattern is A, this pattern is B. So at the beginning, they had no idea really what the patterns meant. Could have been any number of things, different temperatures, different ages of the stars. It was an open question. Uh, so this lady, who was uh, standing over the group in the previous shot, uh, became the supervisor. And which is remarkable, considering that she started at the observatory working as a domestic servant. Uh, she came on the resident side because she was in desperate straits. 
Uh, she was a Scottish immigrant, had come to this country with her husband, but now he was gone and she was pregnant and desperately needed a job. And so she took this position as the second maid in the household and the Pickerings immediately recognized her intelligence and moved her into the observatory, taught her how to do computing and analyzing plates. Uh, and, and then they helped her go home to Scotland to uh, deliver her baby with her mother and grandmother. And they promised her a real job if she would come back, uh, which she did. And uh, she came back and became the first woman to get a Harvard University title as curator of astronomical photographs. And she spent the rest of her life working there. Uh, here's another one. Antonia Mori was the niece of Henry Draper. And she was also a, a graduate of Vassar College, where she had eight semesters of astronomy under this formidable looking lady with the telescope, who was Mariah Mitchell, the truly first lady of American astronomy. Uh, here's another one, Annie Jump Cannon. Uh, the original women were hired to do computing and to analyze the plates, but Miss Cannon, who was a graduate of Wellesley College, uh, came with so much experience as a telescope observer that she did her own observations from the beginning. And this um, drawing of her at the telescope is from a children's book about her called Annie Jump Cannon, Astronomer. So here is a typical plate. Um, Miss Cannon became the one to perfect the classification system. And on the way to doing that, she had to juggle the alphabet a little bit so that the system that is now in use, the, the way the letters are arranged, uh, is no longer A, B, C, D, et cetera, but it's O, B, A, F, G, K, M. And if you're wondering how I can remember that, uh, it's with the mnemonic, O, oh, be a fine girl, kiss me. <laughs> Which is how astronomy students for decades have memorized, they still memorize it that way, although now some of them say, oh, be a fine guy, kiss me, take your pick. So she had a marvelous ability to look at a spectrum and instantly understand what that star was. So she would, you can see there are numbers written all over the plate, that's how she worked. She would put numbers next to the spectra, and then she could call out a number and a letter, and the people writing them down just, just tried to keep up with her. It's, obviously, it's not for everyone. <laughs> One of the uh, great helps to me in writing the book, trying to really bring out the personalities of these people, Miss Cannon was a lifelong diarist. And uh, I got to work in the Harvard University archives. These are the boxes labeled Miss Cannon's diaries. And it uh, was thrilling the day I opened that. Uh, I also spent some time here at the Library of Congress because a lot of the Draper family papers are here. And um, I did find uh, in those folders the guest list for the dinner party that the Drapers held when the National Academy of Sciences met in New York City in 1882, uh, proving that Thomas Edison really was there. Um, Pickering wanted to photograph the whole sky, a tremendous vision of how valuable a resource this would be if he could photograph both the stars visible from the Northern Hemisphere and from the Southern Hemisphere. And he had a wonderful assistant Solon Bailey, also Bailey's wife, Ruth Poulter Bailey, and he sent them to South America to find a place that would be good for carrying on the work down there. This was their first setup on Mount Harvard. Didn't look too promising. Uh, eventually, they really got it together. Uh, in the lee of a, um, 
a thought to be extinct volcano. Turned out to be dormant. Um, they were there for many years, and uh, one of the, several of those buildings house telescopes, although only one of them is dome-shaped. You can, you can have an observatory with a slide-off roof as well, as many of those are. But inside the dome is this gigantic instrument. This has a lens 24 inches in diameter, and it was made specifically for taking these kinds of images. And this was the gift from another heiress, Catherine Wolfe Bruce, who read about Pickering's wish to create a big telescope to use in the Southern Hemisphere, and she just wrote him a check for $50,000. He was very charming. <laughs> um, here, it uh, wasn't all work in Peru. Sometimes they had picnics. Uh, Ruth Bailey is the, um, the one without a hat uh, in the foreground, and then her husband is uh, two people away from her uh, in the hat. And uh, they were down there for years. They brought their child with them because they knew they were going to be there for years. And um, mostly they studied these objects, which are called globular clusters. Astronomers are very straightforward about the way they name things, you know, big bang, black hole. This, this is a globular cluster uh, of stars, and there were a lot of them visible from the southern hemisphere, and they, a lot of them that had a lot of variable stars in them, stars that changed their light over time, which were of particular interest to uh, Pickering and the whole group. And one of the things they tried to do was to count how many stars were in this object. Um, a daunting task, as I'm sure you'll agree. Uh, Henrietta Leavitt is um, uh, another one who came. Uh, she was deaf. Uh, Miss Cannon was also uh, partially deaf, but uh, Miss Cannon wore a hearing aid and was able to go to the opera and to concerts. In fact, the Harvard Archives uh, own many boxes of all the libretti and programs she saved because she was such a music lover. Uh, but Miss Levitt's job was to look at the images from the Southern Hemisphere and track the variable stars. And she made a fascinating discovery. Um, she was, she was particularly interested in this object, which is visible only from the Southern Hemisphere. It's called the Small Magellanic Cloud. Got its name from Magellan's Round the World Voyage uh, because he was the first person to uh, mention them and say that they looked like clouds. They're actually satellite galaxies of the Milky Way. And she figured that all the stars that were in that body were roughly the same distance from the Earth, so that the stars that looked brighter actually were brighter. Uh, usually when you look up at the sky, you can't tell whether a bright star is bright because it's extremely bright intrinsically or because it's very close compared to the others. But here in this object, let's assume they're all the same distance, so the bright ones are, uh, are truly the intrinsically brighter. And she tracked that. She, uh, she published her findings. That was the other thing about Pickering. He published everybody's work under each woman's own name. Uh, always gave credit. They were, all of them, world famous in their own lifetimes. Um, so with her observation um, that the bright stars were really the brightest, she also noticed that of the variable stars, the, the, the variables that got the brightest also took the longest time to cycle through their changes. And that observation enabled um, astronomers to calculate the distance to this object and then the size of the Milky Way. And that rule, which was for a long time called the period luminosity relation, it's now the Levitt law, pass it on, um, that's what Edwin Hubble used uh, to show that 
the little spiral in the constellation Andromeda was actually another galaxy, another Milky Way, an unbelievable distance away. Uh, after Pickering died, Harlow Shapley took over at the observatory, and he was intent on initiating a program of graduate education in astronomy. That was not Pickering's focus. Pickering's idea had been to, to create information and share it with the world, not to train astronomers. And Shapley felt it was very important to train the next generation of astronomers. And um, because of all the interest in the women working at the observatory, several uh, heiresses had contributed money. Um, I've mentioned two of them, um, Anna Palmer Draper and Catherine Wolf Bruce. Another one, Lydia Hinchman, who was a relative of Mariah Mitchell, uh, began a scholarship program that enabled a young woman to come work at Harvard for a year and then be able to go on to work at any other uh, observatory anywhere in the country. And they infiltrated the whole field. I, now I like to say that my Harvard ladies are the grandmothers of the hidden figures because that's why NASA was so open to hiring women as computers. It, it dates back to, to these women. Um, so these scholarships came to be known as the Pickering Fellowship for Women. And Chapley thought, um, okay, I'm going to have graduate students. I have to have graduate fellowship money. And the only money he had, because the Harvard University did not support the observatory financially, so the only money he had were these Pickering Fellowships for women. And he thought he could stretch them to use them for graduate education, but not stretch them farther than that. So the entire first crop of graduate students were all women. Um, well, Shapley was at uh, Mount Wilson uh, in California, and he had gotten his degree at Princeton, and he came from Missouri. So that history was his argument of why Harvard needed a graduate program in education, because they had been embarrassed having to hire a Missourian from California, you know, they, instead of promoting one of their own. But um, his other interest when he wasn't doing astronomy was ants. And he published several scientific papers about ant behavior. And I just wish he could have lived to see this cartoon in The New Yorker. Uh, this was not one of those contests that asks you to supply a caption. It's just that the caption got cut off in the slide. But the caption is, kind of makes you feel small, doesn't it? <laughs> uh, so here are some of our graduate students in astronomy, some of the early ones. The large picture is Margaret Harwood. Uh, she took over at Nantucket. She ran the Nantucket Observatory that had been started by Mariah Mitchell. She ran it for 40 years. And um, she got her graduate degree before these fellowships were instituted um, uh, in California. And the, the woman uh, in the picture with the globe is Adelaide Ames, who came from Vassar uh, on a Pickering Fellowship. And at the bottom is Cecilia Payne, who came from England because she had been told in England that there was no future for her in astronomy in that country. And she knew about the Harvard women. She knew about Annie Jump Cannon's work. And uh, she met Harlow Shapley when he was in England giving a lecture. So uh, she told him she really wanted to come and work there, and he helped her get one of those fellowships. And he pushed her to be the first one to go on for a PhD, which she did. And uh, because she had been in the Cavendish Laboratory at Cambridge, she was the first person who worked at Harvard who really understood atomic theory. And she wanted access to the glass plates to be able to calculate the relative abundance of the different elements in the stars. Uh, that had not been done yet. 
And as she worked, she kept coming up with a ridiculously high abundance of hydrogen, which people considered impossible. You know, that many of the same elements in the sun are found on the earth, and there was a widespread belief that the proportions would be similar. So the fact that hydrogen was maybe a million times more prevalent than anything else, it just seemed ridiculous. So Shapley sent her dissertation to the reigning authority who said that it was impossible for hydrogen to be a million times more prevalent. And um, so in her dissertation, she reported her result, but conceded that it could be an error, could be spurious finding, there could be some explanation that no one had come up with yet. It took only four years from the publication of her doctoral dissertation in 1925 for the entire astronomy community, including the person who had said it was impossible, who did the research to convince everybody that that was in fact the case. That, yeah, it really is almost all hydrogen. Uh, this is one of my favorite pictures of them, although it does give a sense of maybe disrespect that they are lined up like paper dolls. Although there are a couple of men in the paper doll chain. Um, but, but these were some of the pictures that really inspired me to tell this story. And I kept saying over and over again, I couldn't understand why nobody had done it. And uh, turned out that there's really a lot of science that goes on. Uh, the work that they did and what happened in the field of astronomy over this time period. And uh, I spent many days asking myself whatever made me think I could do this, but, um, but I hung in. Uh, here's Miss Payne. She was also a musician. The previous speaker mentioned the connection between mathematics and music, which is strong, but I think it's even stronger between astronomy and music. Almost every astronomer I know has some kind of musical bent. So uh, Miss Payne was an accomplished singer and violinist, and she also started an, uh, an observatory orchestra. And this was a performance of a spoof they did called the Observatory Pinafore, uh, which <laughs> used the music of Gilbert and Sullivan. This is how the plates are stored today, if any of you are wondering. Uh, these are two pictures of the same young woman, Lindsay Smith, who is the current curator. So starting with Williamina Fleming, uh, the curators have always been women. And um, it's a big job. As I said, there are half a million of these objects. And each one is in a paper envelope, carefully barcoded. There's a car catalog. You have to be able to get at the one you need. And uh, in the picture in the um, in her gray sweater, she's looking at the logbooks that were kept by the women as they worked on the images and made notes about them. This is how the plate stacks is that the building, this building was constructed expressly to hold the plates. It was a brick building because the wooden observatory, uh, the director feared, was just a fire trap. And as this collection amassed, everyone not just at Harvard, everyone in the world viewed it as a unique, invaluable resource. And so a brick building was created for it, and definitely fireproof, but as they found out a year ago, January, not waterproof. A water main burst underneath the building and submerged about 60,000 of the plates. Um, but all is well. Um, they, the entire collection was in the process of being digitized because the plates are still in use. And it's awkward to have to go to Harvard and handle these very fragile plates. Uh, so much better if they'll all be available online to anybody. But the digitization equipment, which was all custom built, was also drowned in the flood. So, um, but the insurance money has paid for new equipment, which is faster, better, and cheaper, and so they're moving along, and they probably will, will finish the project more or less on schedule. Uh, how many people have seen Hidden Figures? Yeah. So, as I said, I, I do believe there's a direct connection. And the woman standing next to the movie poster is Alyssa Goodman, who's a professor of astronomy at Harvard, 
her, what it looks like a NASA t-shirt, but it actually says nasty. Those are, <laughs> and she is one of the people I asked to be a technical expert, because I wanted the astronomy to be all correct, of course. And she got completely sidetracked by the story of the women and told me, I've worked here all these years, I know these names, but I always thought they were doing something cute or quaint. I never realized they were actually doing science. So uh, she said she needed to have me come up and teach them their history. So we actually had the book launch in the observatory. Um, this is one of my very favorite pictures of them, also obviously staged, because uh, so many of them are here. That's Margaret Harwood sitting on the floor and Antonia Mori just behind her, and uh, toward the back is Miss Cannon, too busy to look up. Uh, Cecilia Payne is at the drafting table. And they were a great group, very convivial. They, um, they worked together six days a week, and they socialized on Saturday night. And I'm, I'm noticing uh, from my signs that uh, we have only about 10 minutes left, so I'm gonna stop here and ask you uh, to come up and ask questions. I think there will be questions, if not, okay. Hi, thank you very much for your book, first of all. I started reading it and I'm really enjoying it. Thank you. Um, and I just wanted to know how you got started in science writing. I mean, I, I I have an interest in science myself, and, um, but I haven't really thought about writing it. I'm a technical writer, so I'm just curious. Okay, well, I, I wish somebody had told me about science writing when I was in high school, um, because I was always interested in science, and I always liked to write, and I had no idea that I could put the two together. And it was a, uh, a long, unhappy road through college with that split idea. And um, I got hired by IBM as a technical writer uh, because they recruited on campus, and I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But I learned quickly that I was not a fit for corporate, the corporate world. Uh, and I was going to go back to school because the thing I really always loved to do was write term papers. <laughs> so I thought I'd go to graduate school and write some more term papers while I figured out what I was going to do. And, I bumped into a friend of mine who um, was working at the local newspaper, and she said they had an opening, and why didn't I come down and apply? And, you know, it was such a random thing to bump into her and then to go and follow up on it, but that's what I did, and I got hired on the women's pages of the Binghamton Evening and Sunday Press. And within that first week, I felt, so this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And it was great, because it was the year of the first Earth Day. So I was writing about conservation issues, pollution, genetic counseling was just coming into practice. So there was a lot of science to write about, and because it was the women's pages, nobody really cared what I did. I had a lot of freedom, and, uh, and it was great. We still have the women's pages, you know, we just call them style and dining and living. Yes? How long did it take to produce one of the plates and how long does it take to digitize one of the plates? Thank you. Um, some of the plates are very long exposures. So they represent several hours of telescope tracking time. And it was very difficult work to get good images. Um, there were automated clock drives on the telescopes, but they didn't always work well. So the, the individuals who made the plates really uh, developed the art of doing that work. Um, uh, then they had to be developed, and depending where you were, if you were in South America, you had to get them back to Cambridge. And sometimes there were arguments about should we look at them here in South America? Because maybe something is interesting and important in this plate that we should follow up right away while we can. Whereas the women back in Cambridge really wanted the credit for making the discoveries. So that, that became a little a, a friction point at one point. 
Um, as, as for the digitization process, it took a long time to figure out how to do it. Um, the plates all had to be cleaned. So those markings, anything that's going to be digitized, all that has to be wiped off. So all the plates had to be photographed first so that the markings were preserved in some way. Some of them are considered too historic to erase. Um, the equipment had to be built. I think once they actually get it on the machine, the scanning probably takes under a minute. Um, but I will, if you stick around and give me your email address, I will get you an exact answer to how long the scanning takes. Not very long. And they, they do them a big rush assembly line now to, to get it all done. Thanks. Thank you. Yes. Good afternoon. I was just in the talk earlier by the author on hidden art, uh, figures and now in your talk. And yet today we struggle with, with women and um, African Americans in particular, mm -hmm. you know, and their ability to be, not their ability to be, their acceptance, their acceptance right. as scientists in many of the STEM fields. Are there lessons you've learned that would be appropriate both for those faculty who are making the decisions of which women come in or which minorities are allowed into programs or to the actual women themselves? I think probably one of the most important answers is the um, presentation of role models both to young women looking to have that sort of future and to people hiring to realize, you know, most people can name only one woman scientist and it's Marie Curie. So to be able to show a whole room full of people, a whole lab full of people is an important thing. Thank you. Thanks yes. for this great presentation. I just wanted to say that your book Longitude is my favorite nonfiction book of all time. Oh, thank That's you. It. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I'm <laughs> amused by your remarks about how you got into your uh, field. Uh, my uh, Jewish mother would have called that the shikht, which in Yiddish means fate. So you were f fate would, took you to your uh, career. But that's not my question. Uh, my, my question is... Good, because uh, I don't have an answer for that. <laughs> so my, my question relates to those uh, plates that had multiple stars on one plate. Yeah. Now, uh, I understand you could magnify individual stars and analyze them, but when you magnify an image, you lose something in resolution. So I'm wondering, did they ever compare individual slides of individual stars with the plates that had that star among lots of others to see whether you actually did lose something in the resolution when you looked at multiple ones on one slide. Yes, they did. And they, they satisfied themselves that it worked well enough. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for Hi. your talk. Um, a friend of mine from college is an astronomer. She works at Adler Planetarium in Chicago, mm -hmm. and I've always admired her brain and her success, and I think she's great. Um, and, you know, we're at the age now, we're in our, our, our late 50s. Could you tell us, like, how, like, the change for women in science and astronomy from the women that you profiled in this book to now till, you know, girls in grade school, high school, who might be interested in going to the field of astronomy? I'm not sure I understand the question. Can I tell well, you? Well, what, 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 what has changed and if someone... What is, has is, changed? Yeah. Well, I think there have been changes back and forth. I mean, a, a situation like this in the 1880s of having that many women working together was highly unusual at the time. And yet, the work that they did was acknowledged and accepted. Uh, and the situation at Harvard continued up till about the start of the Second World War. After that, there were machine computers and uh, less, less of an emphasis on hiring women. I mean, Pickering was a great, uh, a, a man of great fairness, but he was also very practical. A room full of women costs a lot less than a room full of men. It's still true. So, um, uh, 
All I can say is I may it continue. Thank you. I think the one more. Do we have time for one last question? Yeah, great, perfect. Do you know what the glass plates were treated with in order for the images to adhere to the glass? You mean the actual composition of the emulsion? Mm -hmm. No, okay. I don't. I hate to end on that note. <laughs> but I don't like to pretend I know something when I don't either. Uh, if you want to give me your email address, I will, I will find out. And of course, the emulsion is one of the things um, that people worry about, why the digitization is necessary, because eventually the emulsion separates from the plate, and then, then you're left with nothing. So, thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.